Welcome back to another installment of the Book Eaters podcast. Uh, today we are going to be talking about banned books. And as usual, we have a cocktail to go along with this. Uh, it is a rum drink as we have agreed to do this season. Yes. And because we're talking about banned books, I thought we would do a prohibition era type of cocktail. And so I looked it up on the internets for a rum-based prohibition cocktail and uh, immediately the Mary Pickford came up. Yeah. A rum-based cocktail that was named after a silent film star of the day. It was pretty simple. It's just like rum and grenadine and pineapple juice and some uh, Luxardo cherry liqueur. And I thought, well, this is meant to be because we have Luxardo liqueur from last season. That's right. But it still seemed a little simple. And so I thought I'm going to make my own grenadine, which I'd always thought that grenadine was the juice of maraschino cherries, but okay. it is not. It is pomegranate. It was always so, a mystery to me. Well, now we know. And so I made homemade grenadine and I wanted to make it a little more complex, a little herbaceous because I love an herba herbaceous cocktail. <laughs> And uh, so this is the Rosemary Pickford. Ah! And we will toast. Toast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is delicious. It's tasty, I will say. I thought that most of the Prohibition era cocktails were gin. There was, qu that's what, it was difficult to find a rum based one. Because of the prohibition, there was not a lot of, of a variety in liquor. It was basically right. rum gin and whiskey nah. and i love a whiskey cocktail too but whiskey is not the the uh the drink of the season it is not no so onwards we go as the this podcast is being recorded it is february of 22 it is 2022 and uh one thing that's been coming up a lot lately is some new books have come out and parents are in an uproar they're wanting the school systems to ban them i will and uh, exactly. And it, I think it's timely, but also interesting because this seems to happen quite a bit. You know, it's like these this recurrent pattern of, you know, everything seems pretty chill. And then all of a sudden, well, I was people doing get... some research today about banned books. And they're saying that in the research that I was doing, uh, that there's been an you epidemic. Mean, like, they like with a capital T. Yes. Wow. Uh, actually, Wikipedia, I think is where I said. <laughs> and also a New York Times article. So there's a little bit of legitimacy, but not so much. Uh, that there's been an, an epidemic of people trying to ban books within the la between 2020 and 2022. Uh, that more books have been banned than ever before. That as in something like 421 books have been submitted to be banned. Uh, which challenged. Is, challenged. Which is which is more than normal. Like a huge amount more than normal than when that happened. So it seems like right now, for whatever reason, uh, I think book banning has become political. And we'll definitely delve into that a little bit more because I think there's a lot of theories about what creates the perfect Petri dish for people wanting to suddenly put boundaries in place and mm -hmm. rein things in and, you know, a, a need to sort of feel like they have more control over things, especially when children are involved. For sure. Um, but let's start off with, like, do you have, like, memories of banned books before the current conversation? So I'm going to be honest with you. I did not realize that banned books was still a thing mm -hmm. until our library episode last year. Like, before, I, I felt like we banned books, like, in the past. Like and you then, remembered it as a child because like, – Not even know. as a child, but like in my head it was like, oh, this is a thing we used to do before we were cool, before we realized that everyone oh. should be able to read whatever they wanted. Like in the olden days. Like in the olden days we banned books. When we women couldn't anymore. vote and – But I know that there was an incident in my sister's school or my nephew's school with a book where they wanted to ban it. But other than that, like it seemed like it wasn't a thing that was done very often. Like I didn't – I don't – like in my own childhood – I didn't remember books being banned, or that being a thing or a problem. I do remember uh, Judy Bloom. They being, tried to ban Judy Bloom. They did. I could not get it at school, but I could get it at my local Carnegie Library. Okay. There was one that I think dealt with sex and uh, uh, the, the the protagonist losing her virginity. I don't think I read that. I don't think that one was available. But I did read Deanie, 
which was a, a book about a teen girl who was going through two things. One, right. she had uh, scoliosis. Okay. And then she also found comfort and pleasure by touching her special spot. So masturbation. Yes. I don't understand why it is that we are so dead set against masturbation as an American culture. I think it's a religious thing, you know. Uh, is Like, so God doesn't want us to touch ourselves? Yeah, I don't know if the Bible ever strictly deals with female masturbation, but it clearly states that a man shall not spill his seed upon the ground. You know, like sex is supposed to be purely for procreation and your seed i mean i don't know how else you would interpret that yeah i suppose not you and know, like, i guess back in the day women weren't even considered to be prone to masturbation because right they didn't have urges that was sure, that would be crazy sure i just feel like we're beyond that now like i remember as being a kid like how taboo masturbation even like non-religious wise like masturbation was super taboo when I was young, no one would admit to being like, there was like a joke people would do. Like they'd be like, Hey, I heard there was a rumor that if you, you know, that if you masturbated, the smell would stay in your hand, even if you washed it to see if people would smell <gasps> oh, their no. hands. Like, that was like a joke that people did because it was so taboo. Like the, like the rumor that if you peed in the pool, there was a special dye in it. And that's if it... true. That's a true thing. I, have, that's not <laughs> I don't a rumor. think it is. No, I think that there is a thing that they can put in the pool. Regardless. <laughs> Regardless. It's enough to scare you straight. <laughs> I feel like why is masturbation so taboo? And and why why aren't we I don't know, it just feels like it's almost like an American thing. Like maybe other cultures don't have or maybe they do. I, I don't know. It's hard to know because we only know our own culture. It's true. Especially as children. But in any case, I can remember that yes, it was a book that was supposed to be about masturbation. But when I actually read it, it was, you know, very couched so. in, and so she only said her special spot. And I can remember thinking, well, maybe it's the lump on her back that she touches, you know? Right. Why does it have to be sexual? But I think parents are very uncomfortable thinking about their children as sexual beings, and rightly so. I mean, we don't want to think about that. Um, but also, I don't know, like, I feel like masturbation is better than teenage pregnancy yeah i do i just remember that you know that was supposed to be you know this very controversial book and i thought it was actually kind of a sweet story the sex was you know well i mean there wasn't sex it was just masturbation and it was like i said it was a very if you didn't know what was supposed to be about that and mm -hmm. you didn't know what masturbation was i don't think you would have really picked up on that i think it was sort of a code for if you know you know and if you don't know you can keep popping along with right. your innocence and you know so I thought it was really well done and then as a teenager mm -hmm. I remember hearing about uh Henry Miller mm. and the uh, bohemians you know oh. and the living in the Paris in the 1920s so very apropos right and um Tropic of Cancer was a banned book because it was like so explicit in it's talking about sex and I was like I gotta read it was pretty disappointing. I mean, the, oh. now, it, now it was pretty. What's the e word that I'm thinking Exotic? of? Exotic, no, erotic, ero no, like way, like super out there, like explicit, e explicit. Yeah, I mean, okay. th there was some very explicit details. Details. Wow. But there was no plot. It was very rambling. Uh, I really didn't care about any of the characters yeah. and so in both cases these banned books didn't corrupt me they just made me disappointed in the writers <laughs> so well no not in the case of judy bloom I, henry miller i was disappointed in and i never read another thing except that those letters between him and Anais nin so yeah so with uh but with Judy Bloom, I thought it was a, a beautiful book, and I didn't understand why people were upset about it, which made me always wonder, like, the people who want to ban the books, did, have they read the books? So I don't think that that's always the case, no, especially not currently, right? So one of the things I read recently today when I was doing research for this podcast was that the recently, because it's been so politicized, they were, like, handing out lists of books for people to, like, be concerned about. And so the people who were actually protesting it had not read the books. They were just involved oh. in a movement. It's to the like, mass hysteria. Yeah. And so they haven't read the books and they don't have any idea what they're talking about. Like the Beatles or 
there's messages backwards in the records. And... It's been very politicized now. So it's not even about protecting the children. It's more about moving along a message. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It, so let's talk. Let's talk. So I do think like when we talk about the pattern and sort of this ever emerging you know, history where every yeah. so often, all of a sudden, all of a sudden books are going to corrupt our youth. We have to manage it. Things are getting out of hand. And I think it is when, I, mean, I think it swings, you know, right. because it's not always conservative. I mean, currently it, it's a lot of conservatism, but sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's sure. liberal. You know, there's yeah. a lot of, they wanted to ban Huck Finn because, because of, of the, the N word. And... There's a lot of books they wanted. To, and that, I mean, maybe because I'm more liberal than conservative, that makes some sense to me. Like, why would I want to expose children to that? You know what I mean? And to have those kind of conversations in a place where they may not feel good about it. You know what I mean? It's hard to come away from that if if you were an African-American child, I would imagine, or, you know, right. either way. Like, it's difficult to come away from that feeling any sort of sense of – so I, I kind of understand that, like, why they wouldn't want that or – some of the books, like Gone with the Wind, right, is an example mm -hmm. of one that was that was banned for that reason. Or well, your favorite book, what was it called? Um, to Kill a, to Kill a Mockingbird. Mockingbird. Like institutionalized racism. And then also the whole white savior complex was there saying played a pivotal role in why that was, was banned. And part of me kind of gets it. But on the same token, well, it's so a conversation that we can have, but it has to be a conversation that's cultured by a by a teacher who's ready to have that conversation and people so. are, are not just a teacher, but also a parent. I yeah. get it. So, and, and so the way that we feel about that, a right. book that has the N word in it or a book that, you know, which for me, mm -hmm. if I was going to put, you know, something, which I never would, let's be clear, but like right. one of the problems that uh, with a book that was hugely popular in recent years that I had a big, big problem with was the help. And yeah. the way that, I mean, I hated that whole dine. I mean, talk about white savior, but right. also minimizing how horrible Jim Crow laws were. Right. And uh, I just hated so much about that, how it just made everything funny. That was, I mean, I just hate, I, I don't even want to get into all that. But in any case, I get that. And, but would and you just, want to ban that book? Well, I wouldn't, although right. in some part of me I mean I do judge people who say they love that book I really look hard at them and uh <laughs> it's a little bit of a litmus test about critical thinking skills right. which I mean I'm all for escapism there are plenty of books that I read that I know are not realistic and they just make you happy like so many a lot of historical fiction you know I just like romance novels you know I know it wasn't life I mean sure it's great if you were in the big house but if you were just trying to sell whelks by the seaside. Right. That was a little throw out to Jess because that was a wordle clue, oh, a solution. <laughs> and she was like, what the hell is a whelk? And I was like, I only know because I know. And listeners, okay. What the, is a whelk? The drink is hitting me. Okay. But wow. many uh, years ago, I read a book in which the protagonist was selling like cockles down by the seaside, the hell but it cockles? wasn't. Oh my you know, oh my gosh. Okay. Seashells? Yeah. No, it's like a... Like the ones you listen like to? Like oysters. It. It's like something that you can eat. Okay. Oh. And so in this book, there was someone selling whelk, W-H-E-L-K. She collected the them. The is a prize there. I thought whelk, W-E-L-K, but with an H. Wow, that's a surprise. It's got to be, for Wordle, it's got to be five letters. In any case, that's the only that. reason. And when I put it in, I was like, is this even a word? Am I even remembering this right? But I sort of remembered that there was someone selling whelk mm -hmm. for money. And it was the, it, I won. But in any case. What is whelk? No, I don't even think that was the clue. It's just the thing that got me closer to the clue. I can't remember now. But in any case, when Jess saw it, she was like, how did you know what whelk? Oh, anyways. So I still don't know what whelk is. It's like a some sort of crustacean. No, a mollusk. I think it's a mollusk. It's a mollusk. So it's some sort of like sea creature. Yes, that you can eat. That you would consume after probably boiling it to death in water. Hopefully not alive. But we, okay. we got off track. We're digressing. But the point is that now... The way that we felt about that, like, oh, no, no, that's how probably conservatives feel now with uh, a lot of the themes that are being brought LGBTQ, up. LGBTQ. Yes. Transgender. And, uh, critical race theory. Critical and, race theory. <laughs> right. Which really is that that's debatable. It's fat. As, it's legit. As it not right. being, it's an opinion. Did you, did you read <laughs> the thing about how New York County and Pennsylvania basically, like, you remember during the whole, when, when that guy was murdered? 
by the cop and everyone caught it on videotape. George. Yeah. So they were passing out like information like, oh, you should read these books so that you could get more familiar with it. They apparently took this list that someone had created of black authors that you should read and used it as their banned list to ban every book on this list. Wow. And people probably did. I mean, all of jumped those, right on without all of even books, reading the books. All of those books got pulled for like a year and a half from like the school system that's while what, they were under review. So that's what gets in me. quotes under review. Because, that's what gets yeah. me when something's controversial. People will just be like, oh, this person told me that it's problematic. Done. I mean, at least read it and make your own judgment of it. It doesn't take a year to read a book. And, and the thing about it is, so just like, this is my point. Right. Just like with us, with books that had the N-word in it or the help or whatever. Right. And you just want to be like, nope, none of that jives with my values so i there's levels right so when you talk about banned books there's different things that you ban like you ban them from the school libraries you ban them from the school curriculum you ban them from being able to be sent via the mail you ban them from being able to send overseas right there's different levels of how books get banned so like there's one thing to say like i don't think this book should be in the curriculum i don't think i should force a child to read a book that has the n-word in it or I don't think this book should even be in the library. Do you know what I mean? Those are different. Well, for sure. Those are different discussions. Those are different arguments. But I would argue that if people who are trained to create school curriculums right. Right, have in some way decided that this book has something to teach our youth, right? maybe give them the benefit of the doubt. And I get that, yes, parents want to control how the topic is framed. Sure. But at the same time, that is your platform to explain, you know, even if it's something that's, you know, say if I'm a conservative, well, okay. you know, I'm not, let's say I'm a liberal and okay. the school wants my child to read a book like Huck Finn in which the N word is used. And I am very uncomfortable with that. And I'm just going to be like, nope. Okay. First, I'm going to read the book. And then of course, if you read Huck Finn, mm -hmm. there, there's value there. And then instead of relying on the teacher, right. uh, to which I'm sure the teacher would do an amazing job, I'm going to use that as an opportunity to frame that topic the way that I want. And I can talk to my child about, hey, the N-word is used pretty prolifically. I'm it makes me uncomfortable, and this is why. Mm -hmm. So you use it as a as a great it's a it's it's an avenue into shaping your child even more than just telling them never to read it. I mean, if you want to influence your children, right. you want to shape them and make them into the type of humans that you want to send out into the world to make the world the kind of world that you want, right. use those opportunities I instead mean, of just rejecting them. I feel like that's that has a value. But let's let's say that you if it's, I'm gonna, and I thought about this like from a perspective that would impact me, not necessarily somebody else. But like, let's say the book, and I can't think of one right now, but maybe like, uh, talks about how women are outside of the work. Like, let's put ourselves back in the 1950s and let's say that there was a book out there that talked about how women were working in the workforce and how they wanted to ban that because they didn't think that women should work outside of the home, right? So that's a value that existed. It existed at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say that I had a daughter who was reading that book and people in school were telling her how that this book, for whatever reason, is is incorrect and that women should stay inside the home. And how was that how would that make that little girl feel? Not because I haven't explained it to her, but like how other people are perceiving it or how other people are talking about it and what would that would do to her self esteem. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I think about like with the use like the N word. If someone were to read that and be exposed to that and into an environment where that discussion was happening, where they maybe didn't feel comfortable or didn't have the voice, what, what would that would do to that person's self-esteem? And do I want that to be a required reading and a required discussion in an English classroom? I think like it's that one, if, it's, if you I don't are, think that the book doesn't have value or that you shouldn't read it at home pro, or but, whatever. I just feel the, like it's weird to say in a curriculum. Except that children are going to be faced yeah. with those in real life you cannot protect them from it so better to arm them with your own values 
before they stumble upon it with no guard up, no context, no frame of reference at all. You know, obviously I can't speak to what it may be like for a black student to be reading I mean, a book. For sure, with, I couldn't either. But in your example, if there was, you know, a book saying that, and, and there are plenty, but... I'm sure. That, that sort of idealized this, oh, women have to, and I don't even think it has to be that they work outside the home. Maybe it's that they staying at home is a waste of their time. And I really feel like being a homemaker is a, is a beautiful thing that you can give to your family. Sure. I'm going to prepare my child for those alternating theories from me versus sure. them encountering it from you know strangers and then being thrown for a loop you know what i mean you're you're protecting your children more by explaining it to them rather than hiding it from them i mean i think that that's true to okay. some that i mean to some extent i think that that's true i just i just feel like there is a line between not being in the school library and not being in the curriculum do you know what I'm saying? Like required reading versus optional reading the problem, is is a difference that I think matters to some extent. Like I don't think the teachers should get fired. Like I know that there's a teacher that got fired for like signing capture on the rye. I don't think that people should get fired for that. But And I don't necessarily think that teachers should have to like approve it. But I think that at some point there needs to be framework set up. The problem I to think. To work through those kinds of things. Because like LGBTQ issues, for example, I think that those should be talked about and expressed and and explored but most a lot of these banned books in 2022 deal with transgender or lgbtq issues right but just like you said if you're if you're thinking from a liberal perspective i don't want my child forced to read about a book that has the n-word in it well maybe conservative people don't want their children forced to read a book that normalizes what they consider to be that's what i'm saying like there's going to be like some weird throwback that's going to happen that's going to impact both, all of those kids but in both cases i feel like if you're relying on parents yeah to push the boundaries and expose their children to different opinions it's never going to work because that's a parent's job is to try to imbue their kids right. with their own values now i will say that with my own child i tried to tell her what my values were But also to tell her that my values are different from the way that I was raised and that the important things is that she establishes her own values after doing the appropriate amount of research. I mean, I feel like I did the same thing with Maria. It was more like a... This is how I feel, but this is, shouldn't necessarily be how you feel. You need to do you, you need think, to work out what you think and feel about these things as well. Do you think that was successful? Because I have my doubts. I, I do, also actually. think like children want boundaries. They just want to be told. I think that there's you can create boundaries without without creating silos where they have to believe certain things. You know, like especially with religion and politics, like it's important to have an open mind and to really like think about what both sides are saying. Because even though right now everything is polarized and psycho, it wasn't when Marie was a kid. Things were more gray. Right. Yeah. And I think and I think it, things will the scales will level I at hope some they point. Do. I hope that at some point But right now you're right. In this country it's all us versus them it's and it's so such a like primitive so tedious and a primitive mindset like where has all of this progress that we have made with understanding the human psyche and understanding the pitfalls of being a human and how we are prone to feel these very basic instincts that we kind of need to challenge ourselves right. not to go along with all of that's been like rewound in the last few years I mean, and maybe banning books is not the answer because we need to be able to discuss these issues or kids need to be able to think about these issues. And ultimately, I don't really the only I don't think I mean, I'm being a little argumentative now just to make it interesting because usually you take the conservative viewpoint and I was just trying to give you a break. But generally, I don't think that we should ban any books. I think it's funny to imagine the people in my family and that I went to high school with to hear someone tell me normally April takes the conservative <laughs> You do view. normally, but you do it. Only because I understand it because I was raised but in it. I'm trying to be fair. I was raised in it as well. Like, I'm from a military background. We're pretty conservative. I was a Republican. I voted Republican, you know, well, for I a long time. Well, I I've never voted so, Republican. I mean, we're not going to say that. I mean, I'm pretty liberal now, but that's only because I realized that the Republican Party isn't, it isn't who I am anymore, or it isn't 
it left me like that, it changed that party is not the party so that it's, you it's not the party of lincoln for sure right so it's just things things changed and it's fine what i'm saying is i don't think that i think that reading books any books or hearing other viewpoints is never bad but if i was a teacher not that i am or have gone through any of the schooling or know any of the information or whatever i'm not sure that i would choose books that would make any student feel as if they've been alienated. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm not saying uncomfortable. Uncomfortable is one thing. Alienated is another. Right. And I think you have to be aware, like, if you have one LGBTQ kid in your class, well, then maybe you're going to leave that education for another. You know, you want it to – or you have one black kid in your class. But I, maybe that's not the time to – you know what I'm but saying? But the same token, like, there needs to be representation of those kids because that matters, right? Like, when right. you read a story – and you can see yourself in that character, that's when you first start to love stories. When books start to matter to you, it's like, all right, I can see myself in that character. And if there's not a character that looks like you or sounds like you or thinks like you or feels like you or loves right. like you, it's hard to say that you're going to love learning and love reading. Like You need that. You know, it's interesting. Okay, first of all, it's it's not the teachers that set the curriculum, right? So yeah, I, mean, I wonder what it's like if you are a teacher who are is presented with this curriculum and you have to teach this book that you're opposed to. I mean, what must that be like? I mean, I feel like teachers have the raw end of every deal right now. They love it. Maybe they love learning enough. They love discussing enough. Like maybe it's almost debate where you may be told that you need to defend or oppose a topic that's completely contrary to your own, but you just have to lock it in and do the job. I'm just saying that like when I was looking at the books that were banned of the ones I've read, all of them I've read because of school. So The Great Gatsby, I read that because of school. It was it was banned because of sexual language and references and language. The Grapes of Wrath, that was banned because of language and portrayal of a minister taking advantage of a young woman. I read that because of school, right? Of Mice and Men, vulgar and offensive language, racist language. I read that because of school. As I Lay Dying, worst book I ever fucking read. Offensive and obscene passages referring to abortion, God's name in vain, questions existence of God, and masturbation. Also banned. Those Native Son, I read this in college. So I'm not sure if it counts, but objectional language, violence, sex, and profanity. So of the books that I've read that are on the banned books list, 90% of them were because I read them as part of a, of a curriculum. I don't think that's true for me, but I do think that most books don't come to the forefront of parents' mind. Because let's be clear, it's usually protecting our children is the motivator for banning books. I don't think books come to the forefront of parents' minds unless it's something that their their ch children are bringing home from school. Maybe. So, it, uh, and you're right. Teachers have a raw deal. On the one hand, parents expect so much from teachers. Yeah. And then as soon as – but then they're so quick to say you're not the parent. But then – Right. Teacher, yeah, they have they – have, they have like basically they're expected to be – babysitters and educators and like the work that they're given is ridiculous well, the amount of time they have to spend creating lesson plans which they don't have planning periods anymore you know what i'm saying like it's it's really scary to be a teacher right now and, and a lot of teachers are leaving hmm. and it's going to be the kids that suffer well you know we sort of got into a uh, critical race theory earlier yeah I know you did research on the band books. I did not do so much research on that. But I have been sort of curious because when I first heard that uh, here in Georgia and throughout the United States, mm -hmm. there is this huge thing where critical race theory is not supposed to be taught in schools. Right. And I've really been trying to understand it, that it is considered theory <laughs> and not <laughs> fact. And so I started kind of researching it. Mm -hmm. And... To America is not alone, okay? Britain, Great sure. Britain, does not teach colonialism and the impact that it had on India. You know, it's like a tiny little bleep in their in their history. Sure. The 
apartheid in South Africa uh, is just the bare basic information. And I feel like that's probably the closest sort of parallel with American race. I mean, why shine a light on what's ugly? Yeah, they're just going to say. Yeah. So, but the same thing is in South America. Like, sure, uh, slavery was overcome. Sure. In America. And the mm. apartheid was, uh, you know, ended. Mm. And yet there's still all this disparity with power and wealth. And there's not done, there's not just as in, as in the United States in South Africa, there's not a lot of education on why that is. It's just chalked up with, oh, well, South Africans are lazy. Or if oh, black shit. people really wanted to, they could pull themselves up by the bootstraps, oh, you know, bullshit. all that craziness. There's not. Yeah. And that's a simple answer. Case, case closed. And the whole point of education is to look at things deeper and really it can't be that simple. So it's crap, but, but, but slavery is one generation ago. Right. Well, but like yeah. it's not even, well, you could say in South Africa, it's even, even newer. Like, but here's what's interesting. This is the point. Do you know how the Holocaust is taught in Germany? No. Realistically, they are taught to understand how it happened. The whole group think and the crazy. So, and it's a, a very, like, we're not going to hide the dirty. This is what we did. This is what we did. And they're teaching it to the children. And the interesting thing about it is the, if you look at like an 18-year-old in Germany and an 18, and I'm not an expert disclaimer sure. <laughs> in my limited research, right? They the, the German youth doesn't carry guilt because they know they weren't the perpetrators. And so they don't get hung up on trying to reject that it's true because they're not defensive. Right. You know, they are able to hear it. They're able to understand it and think about it logically instead of emotionally. Sure. Whereas here in the United States, there's all this white guilt. And I'm sure in South Africa, all this white guilt, you know. So it's that's the, the beauty of education is when you take out trying to control and direct and direct the stream mm -hmm. of information and instead you take all of that out and you really teach the facts the guilt goes away because you're able to look at it as i can be better than that right. you can't be better than that if you never realized how bad it was sure i mean i, I think shame 100 percent please plays a huge part in why books were being banned like when i was thinking about this earlier Especially about like York County, Pennsylvania, how they banned all of the books from the list of black authors. Because when they start to think about and critical race theory too, right? Critical race critical race theory basically says that institutional racism is prevalent in today's society still and it's part of the foundation of where we are and who we are now and it and it permeates every every avenue of what's happening. And that we need to start paying attention to that so that we can fix it. So I can see how someone who is not a person of color, because I am, right? I know that there's a lot of shame involved. In it. Like whenever I try to confront it, there's a lot of shame involved for me. And my ancestors were not super bad. Like they worked in the Underground Railroads, right? But Harriet Beecher Stowe is one of my ancestors. And that's, mi that's a mixed bag. That's a huge mixed bag. So... There's a lot of shame involved in that. And it's hard to deal with that because it's not just, when I want to talk about shame, it's not just like these things are happening or these things happened. And so I feel bad about this action. It's more of like, I feel bad about who I am as a person because it's still happening and I'm still a part of it. Like, so in, so critical race theory, he's not just saying like in the past that shit happened. It's saying that shit's still happening and we need to pay attention to what's happening now and we need to fix it. And if it's happening now, who's perpetrating in it? If it's not me, if it's not you, but that who's the perpetrator. So then there's, there's this shame that's not just put on our ancestors as Germans have thought about it. It's the shame that's, it's on me now. Like well, I'm no, but responsible that, for it now. That's what I think I have learned from studying or not studying. Let's be clear. <laughs> Googling. Brief, briefly right. reading up on. No, same, same with me. I don't know what I'm talking about. FY. For sure. Yeah. But I don't think that it's that they're somehow able to escape responsibility because, because of the way that it's taught. I think that, 
facing your past head on yeah. is the anecdote to shame. And we as Americans have never done that. No. And that's why we are still struggling under the yoke of shame. And yeah. if we want to get out from under that yoke, we've got to look at it. We've got to uh, accept it. And we have to understand that we can be better and will do better. Instead of taking it all so personally. Like people think that because you have implicit bias because you've been raised a certain way because of all of these things that that means you are bad it's not no we are all creatures of our environment sure the only thing you need to be ashamed of is if you're not willing to be better i mean and that's something everybody can be sure no matter what your race your uh sexual preference your gender identity your politics your religion everybody can be better and if you don't think that you can then you should be ashamed well i think that the problem though is not is that people feel shame and when you feel shame then that's when cognitive dissonance kicks in right and that's when you say if i'm feeling this way it, it must be because something is wrong externally and not internally. And so the problem isn't me, it's these books. Yep. The problem isn't me, it's this theory. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of mm -hmm. this thing. Instead of me figuring right? it out. Because it's not just me. You know, it's and a bunch at, of us. We all feel this way. Yeah. So we're, we're all feeling this mm -hmm. way. It's not all of us. It's not possible that all of us are to blame. That It's definitely this thing. Yep. And so that's why... It's so easy to point your finger at these books and ban them and get them out of the schools. You know, like, and I feel that way about, like, the LGBTQ, transgender thing and religion as well. Like, when you think about the Bible and Christianity and the different rules in the Bible, right? Murder, you can see why that's bad. Mm -hmm. Stealing, you can see why that's bad, mm -hmm. right? Some things we see that, that make sense, like eating pork. Eh, we, don't, we don't care about that. Touching pigs. That's cool. We can do that, right? But there's a few things. Preparing that, food when you're on your period. It's fine. It's fine. Well, but there's a few things that have remained. Homosexuality, for example, where the Bible is, says you shouldn't do it. But there's no real legitimate reason why we shouldn't do it. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. So instead of like trying to have that discussion about why you shouldn't, you could say, oh, it's unnatural or the Bible says not to do it. If I, if I start to admit things that I believed or held belief for so long in the Bible aren't true. What else am I going to have to admit it's not true? I don't want to do that. Let's not talk about that anymore. Do you know what I mean? I think it's kind of the same sort of thing, you know, where you're just like, these aren't things that I'm, I'm ready to, to deal with because it, it leads to other questions. I'm not saying that people who believe have their faith or whatever completely wrong. And this is an example of why it's wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's very easy to see how there's an armor. And if that's a part of that armor, this is a part of the things I'm not supposed to do. And I start to chink away at that. Now there's a hole in my armor. And how am I going to continue to defend my spirituality, my religion, you know, or anything that asks me to question athe asks me to question my religion, that's got to be thrown out. Like, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, for fuck's sake, is one of the books that's been banned because it makes you question religion. That's ridiculous. I've always had a problem with any religion that doesn't want to be questioned. Because you know who doesn't want to be questioned? Liars. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like I feel like what's what what I'm saying is like you start to like build up it's the same sort of thing like this is who i am if you start to say that things that i'm about me are wrong or things that i believed are wrong all the time yeah but that's when now you that's have a problem to, that's when you have to be like oh why am i getting crazy why am i getting defensive oh that's right if i had no problem if i was really secure in my beliefs i wouldn't mind these questions i i don't understand why people it's cognitive dissonance it's like it's 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 nature's way of making sure that we survive it's how then, we're able to like murder cows so that we can eat the meat so that we can live it's how we're able to milk cows so we can drink the milk so we can live like there's a there's a part of us that has to say in order for me to survive i need to like be able to reconcile these two conflicting beliefs i have to be able to do it i have to be able to say that life is precious and also i need my life to live you know what I mean? Like that's, it's a natural instinct that we have. 
and fighting against it is going to be hard. So the the question is, is there a point where it goes too far? Sure. Can you think, I mean, because I do think that a lot of times uh, free speech, is that the Second Amendment? That's the First Amendment. First, what's the second? The guns. Uh, guns. Both of them are complex issues. <laughs> So if you think of, okay, so the First Amendment, do you feel like, obviously, 100%, it is often misinterpreted and used out of context. Sure. But can it go too far? Like Mein Kampf, you know, if you're looking at Hitler, if you're looking, I mean, can, is there anything that you feel like, yeah, this is toxic and no one needs to read this? So I feel like two things. That they're the government, our government, not other governments, but our government, because we have this rule, should not get involved and uh, prohibit us from seeing things. But Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, the school library, the county library, they don't have to carry that shit. Do you mm. know what I'm saying? Like yeah. there's there's a line between you can do this and I'm going to help you get there. Do you know what I'm saying? So like. I don't have any problem with a company or an individual saying, if you sell that book, I'm not going to buy books from you. Because I'm a boycotter. 100% I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I see something and I'm like, hey, I don't like that, I'm not going to do business with you. And I don't see any problem with that because that's, that's my that's my right. That's so funny. Where I spend my money. But at the same token, I don't want the government to say, you can't read that. And I think at that, that you. But have, I'm okay with them saying I'm not going to sell it to you. I think you have just distilled it into the perfect thing that everybody should be able to agree on. Banning is bad. Boycotting is a right. Right. So do that. Just do that, people. <laughs> just do that. I mean, but it's hard if it's a curriculum. It's hard if, like, my grade no, depends on it. Pull your kids out of school, homeschool them, send them to a private school, change your move and have them go to a different district. Do what you got to do. If it's That's that important to you, yeah. if it's that important okay. to you that you don't feel like your parenting can t counteract whatever they are learning in the free school that they go to every day and right. you care about it that strongly, you will figure out a way to counterbalance it. Okay. I mean, okay. It's all gotten pretty heavy and intense. Oh, wow. Let's lighten it up with the bookend. <laughs> all right. I'm down. Okay. So for the bookend, mm -hmm. I went back into uh, the banning of things. Right. I am going to describe either a drink or a food item that has been banned in the United States. And you try to guess what it is. Okay. 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 I'm excited. All right. Let's start with the drinks. Okay. The drinks. This will be the easy one. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, drink of Swiss origin. Very common in the uh, world of the Bohemia. Mm -hmm. um, it had uh, a component through John, through, through Joan, which was considered a hallucinogenic. Oh. And uh, because of its uh, wormwood and annies and the green uh, tint Absent. to it. That's what it is. Absolutely. Check, check, ding, ding. Do, 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 do. Um, also, scientifically, okay. none of that was true about absinthe, but oh. people get caught up in the fury of the moment. Uh, okay, let's uh, skip forward a little bit in time to the uh, late aughts of, okay. of the uh, of So the 2008? Yes, this was a drink that sought to combine caffeine and alcohol. Oh. And the body was not meant for such things. And so it was banned until they reconfigured the recipe so that there was no longer caffeine in it. I feel like Red Bull and the vodka? No, it was one drink that you got in a can. I got into a can? Uh-huh. And it was uh, caffeine and alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. You could get it at any 7-Eleven for like three ninety seven. Shit. I don't know. Four loco. I would never have known that. I don't know what that is. Mm. Four loco is caffeine and alcohol. Yes. What did it taste like? Shit. Hmm. <laughs> All right. This is a newer thing that I have not tried. Okay. Uh, it has been banned in several states because 
according to my research, it's basically uh, crystal light, but alcohol. I believe in crystal light because I believe in me. <laughs> so imagine if you could have like a little to-go packet okay. that you could sprinkle into your 16-ounce bottle of water. And have a cocktail right there ready to go. Damn. Right. It sounds pretty awesome. but it's, I like it. But it's banned. It was called palcohol. Like your pal. I don't even know what palcohol is, <laughs> but I would like to have it in my life. And then the last one is from a uh, a London bar. Okay. Uh, was serving a drink. Uh, they got shut down because that drink uh, was a scotch whiskey. Oh. That had been imbued. What do you call it when you put stuff like an olive oil infused? infused. It was uh, infused with a, and I'm sure it was very expensive because they only had one five centimeter strip of whale skin. Gross. Mm -hmm. What do you think they named that drink? So Scotch whiskey and whale skin mm -hmm. in London. Whale ski. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be kicking themselves <laughs> but no it was called the moby dick oh the moby dick all right now for some An old white whale food items is okay. that a book that's ever been banned i don't think so because mm. we're all good with Captain i would think so i think some animal activists wanted that to... i did not ever see i did not see that any of my brief google research today true Her good old herman he 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 you know Emerged unscathed. All right, so these are, these are food items. Okay. This is a type of seafood that, when properly prepared, is uh -huh. considered a delicacy and may produce a slight numbing of the lips. But if poorly prepared, it will, it will kill, kill you. you. I think I've heard of this. Kind of, it's like a sushi. It's like a... Um, I've heard of this before. Ah, what is it? A puffer fish. <laughs> That's okay. How know. did you get that? <laughs> Avery was making a puffer face. <laughs> it was oh. quite endearing. I wish you could have seen it. <laughs> okay, so uh, this has been banned in the U.S. since 1997. It's sort of like a Cadbury cream egg. I love a Cadbury cream egg. That's my favorite. Instead of cream, there's a toy inside of it. What? Oh, Which, a Kinder egg. That's right. Yeah, I think that's really stupid, actually, because the I guess you could swallow the parts or whatever. But I, in Germany, I lived in Germany for many for a couple of years, oh. and we had Kinder eggs, and I think they're amazing. Well, and now they have this other stupid Kinder product that's not quite a Kinder egg, separate, but kind of a Kinder egg. It's lame. Yeah, but apparently American kids are too dumb. We swallow shit. It's really even more than that. It's the parents. Yeah. We'll just give our kids shit and won't be able to like monitor them to know that there's a toy inside and maybe a two-year-old could choke or whatever okay so that yeah. point ding ding okay i got absence and i got kinder egg on my own what on now own. okay you <laughs> may get this all right this is a uh, has been banned in the u.s since 1971 because it's made out of sheep's pluck oh which is like awful and it contains the uh heart and the liver but apparently the problematic part is the lungs of a sheep oh. very famous in scotland but other parts Haggis? that is right that is right it can be made here but it can't be imported oh i see and then finally last one i had never heard of it and it is by far the most disturbing okay this is a sardinian cheese okay a pecorino cheese oh that is basically, they take a whole wheel of that cheese, they uh, expose it to the elements, It is the flies are attracted to it and lay their eggs in it. Oh. Uh, the maggots come oh, out some maggots. and eat the fat that makes it super creamy. Oh. And then uh, when you go to eat it, which is most commonly done with bread... Uh, the habit is to sort of poise your hands above the sandwich, so to speak, because the maggots will jump out. They uh, want to eat the maggots? Yeah, they, well, it's either or, you know. It's maggot cheese? It's like, it's like shrimp. Some people eat the tails. Is it a maggot and cheese it, sandwich? <laughs> 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 exactly. Now, if you are a person who does not like to eat the maggots, you can put your sandwich mm -hmm. into a, a sack 
a paper sack, not a egg sack of some sort, because <laughs> that would be even creepier. But you put it into a paper sack and seal it up and then wait for the maggots to die <sighs> and then eat it. So you eat the dead maggots. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like a... You ever heard of that? A dead mac and cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard of that kind of cheese? No. It is called Kasu Marzu. I'm gonna try. And it is banned in the United States, so don't get your hopes up. Uh, Let's hopes. go to Sardinia. Hearts no. When in Rome. I, I have to admit, I leave in the country. I would probably try it. I feel like I would not eat maggots. I would eat it if it was lovingly prepared. I feel like no. Because maggots would die. And you feel like maggots deserve their chance. I feel like no, no, I just don't. There's want one to thing eat. the world needs is more flies. Lord of the Flies was also a book that's been banned. (laughs) And that brings us full circle. (laughs) Before I start, like, you know, getting uh, maggots sent to me in the mail. Um, There's a lot to ponder from this episode. For sure. We totally went off topic. Crazy. I I think you're super smart, Michelle. Oh, my gosh. And I really enjoy hearing your, your, your ideas and your beliefs. Because you feel nice to me. No, I mean, I love you. I love you too. All right. Well, until next time, eat eat the the books, books, motherfucker. motherfucker.